I am recording now and you can go ahead and start with the introductions. It's all yours. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Tuesdays Explorers, a series of lifelong learning opportunities brought to you by AARP Virginia. I'm Opal Elliott, an AARP volunteer community ambassador with AARP Virginia. So AARP is here to make your voice heard and provide information and resources on the issues that matter and to connect with you with fun learning opportunities like we're going to have today. We provide valuable educational, informational and fun resources, things like webinars, teletown halls, discounts and more. When it's safe to host in-person events, you'll be invited to attend. In the meantime, AARP will continue to offer programs virtually. During Black History Month and beyond, AARP wants to shine a spotlight on local leaders who have helped their communities survive and thrive. So I'd like to thank my co-host also and helper today, Trudy Murado. Like me, Trudy is a volunteer community ambassador with AARP Virginia. She will be monitoring the Q&A box and will facilitate the Q&A portion of our program. We will have some time for Q&A at the end of today's presentation. So please submit your comments and questions in the Q&A box. We expect the program to last for about an hour. I am just delighted to talk a little bit about Tenor Hill, which was a once a thriving African-American community that made up over 39% of the population of the town of Falls Church, Virginia. Made up of free, enslaved, and emancipated African-Americans, these civil rights pioneers fought against segregated housing beginning in 1915 by establishing an organization that evolved to become the first rural branch of the NAACP in the nation. Many of the original families lived, worked and worshiped in Falls Church City and continue to do so. Their remarkable achievements included preventing the town from implementing a segregation ordinance, building churches, schools, businesses, and self-help groups. Miraculously, historic homes, churches, and other remnants of that great community remain today. That is in part due to the caring community activists like our guest speakers today. So it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Nikki Graves Henderson, History Project Director at the Tenor Hill Heritage Foundation and her husband, Edwin B. Henderson II, a local Falls Church, Virginia community historian and founding director of the Tiller Hill Heritage Foundation. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Nikki and Edwin. Nikki and Edwin, the screen is yours. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. I'm delighted to be able to have lots of ears to listen to the stories about Tenor Hill Historic District and the Tenor Hill Historic Site. Many of you um, may know Northern Virginia. We are six miles from the nation's capital and our huge little city has a population of just under 15,000 people now. And it's 2.2 square miles. So it is called the little city for a reason. In the, um, before the Civil War, there were free, Black people living in Falls Church, enslaved Black people living in Falls Church, as well as emancipated African Americans. And the story that we want to tell is after 
the Civil War. During the Civil War, there were African Americans who served in the US colored troops, and there were African Americans who stayed behind, such as George Bryce. You'll hear the same names over and over again as I talk, because there were families who, such as my husband's family, were here from before the Revolutionary War and others who came here right after the Civil War. But the thing that is so remarkable is that their descendants still either live here, work here, or worship and socialize here. There are approximately six historic churches in Falls Church. Two of them are African-American churches that were founded right after the Civil War, Galloway United Methodist Church and Second Baptist Church. And if you go to either one of those churches, either Sunday, especially on um, family day, you will find the descendants of all the people that we're talking about from 200 years ago, worshiping in those churches. When there are social events, you will find those same families represented. And I, um, being a Northerner, was just floored when I came here and discovered what a jewel of history that's been preserved here in this community. I want to change the... I don't even know that they're seeing that. Are, are they seeing the slides? Yes, they are. Okay. So this is Falls Church. Uh, as you can see, we're in Northern Virginia, not far from the capital and leading into places like Dulles, Ashburn, Leesburg. It's all just a quick com commute. We're uh, located, nestled between Arlington County and Fairfax County along uh, what was known as Lee Highway. But there's a story about that as well. Now this map is today um, as you can see, the map has, where you see the white round circles, those are places that are either still standing or while there may not be buildings there, they have sites that are associated with African-American history. There are eight homes that have been declared a historic district by Fairfax County. And those homes were built by the Tenor family who shortly after the emancipation purchased the land, Charles and Elizabeth, his wife. And during um, their lifetimes, they built a home and then divided the land so that their 10 children would be able to build homes. And those homes are still standing for the most part. There are a few that were torn down for various reasons, but we'll talk a little bit more about some of the things that happened that were historic, that had significance, not only locally, but nationally. And this is another map that gives you an idea of where the sites are that have to do with African-American history. These are numbered. You will also, also see a red line that represents how the town was gerrymandered. In 1887, the town was approximately 39 to 40% African-American and the town was run by Democrats. And this is not the Democrats of today or the Republicans of today, but most African-Americans voted Republican at that time. And so the town decided to gerrymander the borders and they 
gave back one third of the town to Fairfax County. Now, because it was a very small jurisdiction, those voters, African-American voters had power in their votes. But when they were ceded back to Fairfax County, it was a much larger jurisdiction and they did not have as much power in their votes that they had in Falls Church. So it meant a lot to the community in terms of losing not only land, but power. Uh, the, uh, Democrat, the Republican party in those days was the party of Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was a Republican. And by gerrymandering the black community, the Republicans out of Falls Church, the town, it meant that black people had no say in town matters anymore. Tenor Hill Heritage Foundation was founded by this gentleman over here and another gentleman um, to preserve the early civil rights history of Falls Church. It was here in Falls Church that in 1915, the town attempted or proposed passing an ordinance which essentially would have segregate how, segregated housing and the members of the African-American community, many of them were educated, some of them were artesians, some were uh, skilled laborers, and they got together, nine men called them and their wives, I'm sure, <laughs> um, they call themselves the Colored Citizens Protective League, and they met on Tenor Hill at the home of Joseph and Mary Tenor, and they decided they were not going to tolerate such an ordinance. This was more serious than just segregated housing. What the ordinance would have made Black people do that were in certain districts was to sell their, home, their homes and their property to white people and then move to an area that had been designated for colored only. So it wasn't just about segregation, it was about uh, taking away people's hard-earned property. For instance, the house that we live in today, the home of Edwin and uh, Mary Ellen Henderson was in a white district. They had just built the home two years previous to this ordinance, and they would have had to sell it and then move. So it's a little bit more serious than just segregated housing. Well, while we're talking about the Henderson house, I'd like to tell an interesting side to that story. Back at the time, many people were not able to buy home property or homes because of prejudice and discrimination. So one of the ways that African-Americans and immigrants entered the home buying market was to buy a piece of land. Sometimes uh, they paid inflated prices. Sometimes they had friends or supporters who were white who would pretend that they were buying the land for their own use or they were going to flip it as they say these days. But uh, one of those people was uh, Colonel John Crocker who purchased the land for Galloway United Methodist Church to be built upon. But the Hendersons bought a house kit from Sears. Sears sold houses like they sell pants or bicycles today. This house was model number 225, and it paid, they paid $1,400 for it. That was the base price, but they added on $400 worth of eight, um, extras. So they had a quarter of an acre of land, and they built the house, which was delivered by railroad. You either got your friends or hired people to help you build the house, 
and the house is kind of quirky. There are a few little things that I'm sure are because it was a kit home and people added their own personal touches. But it's been here since 1913. You want to talk about this slide? The other homes that are in the area uh, that are still standing are on Tinner Hill. And those homes are excellent examples of early 20th century vernacular architecture. And that's unique because there are homes that are preserved, but it's usually rich or famous people or infamous people. But these were everyday working class people whose homes are still standing on Tinner Hill. Yeah. This slide shows the Tinner Hill Monument, which was built in 1999, which was dedicated in honor of those who uh, were involved in the 1915 fight against the segregation ordinance. And the arch was a signature um, architectural feature of Joseph Tenner. And it's made out of pink granite, which he quarried, um, he had a quarry, which he paid 50 cents a day to actually quarry the stone out of the uh, trip to run and then to use that, those stones in his structures. Falls Church Bank was built with it, the Presbyterian Church, the Catholic Church, and many other structures as well around town. It's also interesting that if you drive around Falls Church, you will see people who have chimneys or gateways made of the pink granite. And I've had several people tell me that they decided to remove the paint from their fireplaces and discovered that it was made of pink granite. In 2006, Falls Church or the Tenor Hill Historic Site, which was the area where the Joseph Tenor and Mary Tenor home once stood, received a state historic marker. And at that time, there were only two state historic markers, one at the Falls Church, Episcopal Church, for whom the city is named, and one at Tenor Hill. And most recently, the Henderson House was also given a state historic marker. In 2015, Fairfax County designated the Tenor Hill Historic District. Uh, it's called the Tenor Hill Historic Overlay. And it covers, it's a little cul-de-sac. And I tried to um, make a film to show you what it's like, because if you are on South Washington Street. It's very busy, trucks, cars, a lot of traffic, and there's lots of development going on. But if you walk up just this little tiny hill, you come to Tenor Hill, and that's where you'll find nine historic homes. The earliest one was built in 1867, I believe, by Charles and um, Elizabeth Tenor, and it's still occupied by his granddaughter and her husband, mm -hmm. Becky and Sam Stotts. Yeah, this slide right here also shows, okay, if you see, you see the state historic marker, but you also see the Tenor Hill Historic District, which was a collaboration between Fairfax County, City of Falls Church, Tenor Hill, and the uh, Nova Park, so as it was called then, uh, Northern Virginia Regional Park Authority. So we have a hundred year agreement with them to preserve the historic site for educational purposes. 
and hopefully, well, no, I don't think I'll be around in a hundred years. <laughs> I think we've got about 90 years left. So I don't think I'll be here, but the site will be preserved and this important history will go yeah. on. Yeah, Covenant was put on the land and I believe it's in perpetuity, but a hundred years may be correct. You heard us mention the Falls Church Episcopal that for whom the city was named in 2016, after uh, working with the church and some of the members, we were able to have a plaque installed to acknowledge the enslaved African-Americans who helped to build the church. It turned out that um, James Wren, who was the architect, originally there was a sign or a plaque that acknowledged his um, design of the church, but there was no mention of people who actually built the church. So that was um, a big moment in the church history, correcting and acknowledging, and as you can see, repenting for their involvement with slavery and the construction of the church. Uh, in 1964, um, Melvin Lee Stedman wrote this book, The History of Falls Church by Fence and Fireside. And um, within that book, there is, um, they interviewed my grandfather, Edwin Bancroft Henderson, who told the stories of, of his legacy and how he came to um, live in Falls Church. He was uh, enslaved, his people were enslaved on the Fitzhugh Plantation, which uh, is a, um, a um, it's a area here, which is, uh, highlighted, well, it's, it's really just uh, lighter than everyone else, but it was the largest plantation in Fairfax County. And uh, when his ancestors, his native ancestors, uh, Chief John was um, killed in an effort by uh, Colonel Broadwater to clear the land of the Indian presence. Um, the uh, Chief John was killed and the baby Papoose was thrown to the side during the skirmish and given to the enslaved people there to raise. This is, uh, if you look at this, this is a inventory of Mordecai Fitzhugh um, when he died in 1858. Uh, my great-great-grandmother, Eliza, is right here, the bottom. Uh, she was uh, valued at $800. And actually, uh, she ran away not um, too long after um, the death of Mordecai Fitzhugh. She was 12 years old, and she ran away to try to be with her mother and her family. And then she was sold down south into Louisiana. These are some of the um, uh, documents that we have from my family, my grandmother's family, the Robinson family, Mary Ellen Henderson's people. On the right, on the left, you see uh, the free papers of Robert J. or R.J. Robinson. But we went to the Library of Virginia and found that when they moved from Winchester to Springfield, Illinois, they had to have. Uh, travel passes. And this is what we found, which indicates uh, Robert and his brother's travel passes. It also includes the name of their, grand, their father, Jonathan. Harriet Foot Turner is another one of the people that I think should be applauded. As you can see, she was very fair 
and she worked on the Fitzhugh plantation. And one of her duties was to fetch the newly arrived enslaved people at the Alexandria slave mart. And she went one day with the intent of not doing as she was told. So she pretended to be their master and she could read and write. She forged travel passes and she was able to lead 12 people to freedom in Canada. Well, of course, after she had done this, she could not come back to Falls Church, but she was able to keep in contact with her family here. And my husband and I have done a lot of research and found that she settled in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which had a large free black population. She owned several properties there. And according to their records, she raised a child who was born here in Falls Church, Ellen Scipio. There's a street here in Falls Church called Scipio Lane, where the Scipio family lived. So it's a very interesting history. And if you're familiar with Falls Church and you know where the new Target store is, that was the land, part of the land that she owned in Falls Church. She purchased it so that her mother could be taken care of because she couldn't come back to take care of her. And when she passed away, and when her mother passed away, they were buried at Galloway United Methodist Church. And you can see their headstones if you visit there, along with a number of other families that made huge contributions to Falls Church. The Tenors, of course, uh, Summerall, I always wondered about Mr. Summerall because he was listed in the committee of nine as one of the founders. But after about a year, we didn't hear anything else about him in any of the records. And it turned out, I learned from his great grandson that he had passed away in the 1918 flu epidemic. At the time I learned it, I wasn't impressed, but now that we've had our epidemic, I understand just how devastating it was. And this is another very well-known family here in Falls Church, the Bryce family. Uh, Harriet Bryce was a free woman of color. We're not sure how she received her freedom, but her husband was enslaved. And people might find that kind of odd. However, the children born to any marriage or any relationship took the status of the mother. Therefore, it was more important for the mother to be free. And many times you found that the husband was described as being enslaved, but the mother free so that the children would be free. And Miss Bryce and her husband were instrumental in starting the Galloway United Methodist Church. They had a close association with Columbia Baptist Church, who uh, the minister there, the minister Hiram Reed and his brother, the uh, lay minister encouraged blacks to start their own churches. And as a result, Second Baptist and Galloway began and those churches are still in operation today from the 1860s and I believe 1871 or 1872. You can go by and visit. Also uh, in that same year, 1864, uh, Frederick Forrest Foote um, purchased 28 acres from his former master, um, Daniel Miner at what is called today Seven Corners. Uh, Fred Foote was a blacksmith and he joined the US Colored Troops, but he was allowed to work on the canals and the railroad in order to make money where he made the $500 uh, to buy the 28 acres from Daniel Miner. 
that's another thing that's very interesting. People think that slavery itself was monolithic, but it was not. There were some people who were enslaved or in bondage. And after they finished their chores, which were usually calculated to last anywhere from 12 to 16 hours a day, some of their owners would allow them to tend to their own gardens to supplement their food supply or to work for money. Some of them took the money, gave them a small pittance. However, uh, Fred Foote's owner allowed him to keep his money and in that way he was able to purchase land. Well, actually, the um, Emancipation Proclamation was in effect here in Falls Church because Falls Church was behind Union lines. And therefore, January 1863, the African Americans that were in this area that was controlled by the Union troops were set free. Many of them actually joined the US colored troops and took up arms against the Confederacy. Uh, such was the case with Fred Foote, as well as George Bryce, Harriet Bryce's husband. And George Bryce for a, quite a while, they called him, um, they didn't say spy, but they would say, whenever there's any commotion, George Bryce comes behind the lines and tells us what's going on. His job during the day was to protect the land of the men who were away fighting the war. And in return, they would give them a small percentage of whatever, whatever they were able to save. Which brings me to another interesting point of um, history here in Falls Church. And that is the Home Guard. The Falls Church uh, City had an interracial Home Guard. It was 50% white and 50% black, and they were armed. And we've discovered records that talk about who was in the Home Guard, what they did. One of the things that is commonly known was that John Reed was murdered by Mosby's Raiders. And what's not commonly known was that he and his daughters were running a school, first a Sabbath school yeah. and then a weekday school for African-Americans who wanted to yes, learn sir. to read or write. Okay, okay here we come, uh, James Lee and much of the area that was gerrymandered out of the town in 1887 is called the James Lee community. He was a pillar of the African-American community. Um, he bought a large swath of land, thanks with the assistance of Colonel John Crocker. Um, and he gave land for the Second Baptist Church, as well as the Falls Church Colored School. Now he also had a brother, Charles Lee, and the two of them came from Fair, uh, Farquhar County. And to show you how different things were, um, one of them joined the US colored troops and the other one was detained by the Confederates and made to dig ditches. He was made to dig ditches in Centerville for the Battle of uh, Bull Run. This here is a picture of, of Charles Lee's gravestone. It's a U.S. Colored Troops gravestone, and it's, in, it's located in the Galloway Methodist Church Cemetery. And you'll find several U.S. Colored Troops headstones in uh, Galloway as well as Second Baptist. Cemeteries have a wealth of information about the people who lived here. Here we have uh, the son of Frederick Forrest Foote, Frederick Forrest Foote Jr., who must have been a very dynamic personality. Um, at the center of town, he owned a grocery store. 
at the corner of what is now Leesburg Pike and South Washington Street next to the Falls Church. When Falls Church became a town in 1875, Frederick Foote Jr. was elected as the town constable in 1875. And then uh, he became a town councilman in 1880. We have this document here, which shows his uh, certification as a member of the Falls Church Town Council. One of the things that's interesting about uh, Falls Church at that during that time period is that businesses along that main road were interracial. They were owned and operated by blacks and whites. Uh, there was a shoe shop, there was a grocery store, and it was owned, they were both owned by African Americans and they were patronized by whites and blacks. Here is a map, it's called uh, the Hopkins map of Falls Church, the town of Falls Church. This is from 1878, and I've um, circles a number of the uh, black owned businesses. Uh, here in the middle here, we have the old um, Ch Falls Church. And here we have uh, FF Foot store right on Leesburg Pike. This is the uh, George Price. This is uh, actually Harriet Price is the one who who bought it, but uh, George so was her husband. <laughs> and here's another property owned by George Bryce, another property owned by George Bryce. And then we have this property here that was owned by Harriet Turner, who we talked about earlier. Now we come to the maps that show the gerrymandering. Um, Falls Church has given up a lot of land <laughs> to be just a dark area. That's what exists today. But they gave up this area here, uh, which was where the black population lived, which they um, um, gerrymandered out of the town. This property here was land that they gave up when they became a city and gave back to Arlington County. Then we come back to Eliza Hicks. We saw her in the inventory of uh, Mordecai Fitzhugh earlier. And we don't have, we believe that this is her picture inside of her store. In 1888, she purchased the store from Fred Foote Jr. who had fallen ill. He died in 1889. And um, she built, she sold the first part that was fronting on Leesburg Pike to get rid of the mortgage. And then she built a Victorian home and then the store she continued during her lifetime until she died in, in 1911. Now, the other thing that's interesting about her is that when she was sold into slavery, she was sold to uh, Mississippi, into, down to Mississippi. And she escaped and followed the Union soldiers back to Washington, DC, where her family was. And at that time, she had had a child by her husband who mysteriously disappeared. But she walked from Vicksburg to Washington with her baby son, her infant son, hidden in a trunk. Now, this building is really interesting because originally it was owned by Hiram Reed, the minister at Columbia Baptist. And he encouraged Blacks to learn to read and write. And this is the site of the first colored school. Now we've been able to trace that school relationship to Emily Howland, who was a 
Quaker and an abolitionist and a very close associate with, um, please, the name is escaping me, um, but- Matilda Miner? No, Her, um, Harriet Tubman. <laughs> Harriet Tubman. And most recently, I think within the last three years, they discovered a photograph in Emily Howland's personal scrapbook of Harriet Tubman as a young woman. And that photograph is on display at the African American Museum in Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. So you had a number of people who were abolitionists that were teaching and were visiting and corresponding back and forth with the Reed family, Betsy Reed and John Reed. And they had another daughter, Charlotte, who was also involved with teaching and uh, African-Americans. And it was risky to do that because it was against the law. It was so risky that they stopped having classes in the building that you see here, which was probably a log cabin at that point. And uh, Betsy would go around to the houses of African-Americans pretending she was visiting with groceries or something of that sort. And her father was murdered by Mosby's raiders. And at that point, she decided that it was just too much for her to bear to continue with teaching. But they are buried at the Falls Church. And we have many course copies of correspondence between she and Emily Howland. So I think Falls Church has a bit of a hidden history that we've been able to uncover just the teeny bit, um, simply because who was going to actually write a letter saying, oh, and by the way, I'm an abolitionist. Right, and after the um, Fugitive Slave Law of 1850, uh, people's activity as far as uh, abolition, particularly the Underground Railroad, if you participated in anything, um, you were subject to prosecution. Uh, but the school in 1862 among African-Americans was really the first organized um, uh, education for minors and adults, mind you, um, in, the, in the town of Falls Church or in Northern Virginia, because really uh, uh, education wasn't, public education wasn't mandated until the 1880s. Here we have Louisa and William Henderson, who continued to run the grocery store of Eliza until the 1930s. Uh, Louisa ran the store and was an active civic uh, was active in civic organization Falls Church. William um, was in the Navy. They briefly moved to Pittsburgh, thinking that they would find better opportunities there. And um, then he moved back to the area and was hired to uh, the printing and engraving office in DC. Uh, if you look at this picture here with Louisa, uh, the young gentleman that's standing with the hat, um, that's my grandfather, Edwin Bancroft Henderson. And this is Edwin Bancroft Henderson. Uh, who was the primary organizer of the CCPL and the uh, Falls Church NAACP. He was an author, civil rights activist, physical education, aided, physical educator, and uh, is credited with introducing basketball to African-Americans for the first time on a wide scale organized basis for which he is, was inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame in 2013. Now, this is a flyer from 1915 where the town was putting forth the question, should they segregate housing? 
yes or no. And this was the impetus for starting the organization that evolved to become the first rural branch of the NAACP. And I have to say that these nine people and their families took their lives into their very hands because at the time, Falls Church was a very rural community. There were small family farms. And that's where most of the atrocity to black people, atrocities to black people, such as hangings and so forth took place. And when the group got together, they asked the NAACP, which had yes, just- yes, we got had just been formed in uh, 1909. So many of them could have lost their lives or their livelihoods. So it, it took a great strength of character. Yeah. Um, this, when they proposed the ordinance uh, in early in January of, 1915, um, there was a letter writing campaign that went around and it was not, uh, um, they brought in a couple of lawyers which made the case that uh, it was unconstitutional to the town council. So the town council did not vote on it, but rather, um, as it says in the flyer here, put it forth to the citizens of the community on whether they wanted the ordinance to be in place, of which it was approved by the citizens of the town. It was voted yes. And right after that, a suit was brought against the town, which brought an injunction so they could not enforce it. And the it was um, argued in um, Fairfax County Circuit Court but the judge would not rule on it because there was a case coming before the Supreme Court with similar um, um, facts. And that was Warley versus Buchanan in uh, 1917. And uh, the decision in that case was that uh, such ordinances were unconstitutional. And therefore the uh, ordinance here in Falls Church could not be enforced. Here are the handwritten minutes that we found. Let me just say that uh, these things, the flyer, the minutes, and many of the things that we found here were, we found, I found them in a box in the attic as we were cleaning out um, things in my, uh, in our summer home down in Annapolis. And so I asked my sister for it and I found all of these fantastic um, um, primary sources that we have used to tell the story of um, the struggle for civil rights here in Falls Church. These are the minutes from January 8th and the second one is from January 18th. And uh, we went to the Library of Congress and found this, wait a minute, this jewel here which is the letter to W.E.B. Du Bois asking to form a branch of the NAACP. The letter that came back uh, said that we are fearful for your safety. However, uh, we will provide your committee with resources so that you can fight your case. And um, let me go back. This is Joseph Tenner, and he was a pillar of the African-American community. He was a stonemason. Uh, that's why we built the arch. Um, he, used, he used pink granite. He uh, was known as an orator, and um, he was elected the first president of the Colored Citizens Protective League, and then the first president of the Falls Church NAACP which was established, um, they were allowed to form a charter in 1918 
after some of the bylaws were changed because the first bylaw said that you had to have 50 people sign up in order to form a branch. You weren't gonna find 50 people in a small rural community taking their lives and their livelihoods in jeopardy to, um, to fight against injustice. Here is uh, the membership report of the charter um, from the 1918 uh, creation of the Falls Church and vicinity NAACP. Um, it was later, there was another charter created in the 40s, 1940s, that made it the Fairfax County NAACP. This branch was the first rural branch in the nation in the whole United States. This uh, is a engineering map from 1922, we believe, which shows the rerouting of the Fairfax County Courthouse Road to create what, it, what we know now as Robert E. Lee Highway. They rerouted it from going this way here and, and down to coming right through the African-American community. Here we have Cato Adams on both sides. He was African-American. Um, Henderson, both sides. Henderson, both sides. These and Bryce, Betty Bryce, both sides. We know it was taken by eminent domain because on either side of the projected road, you see the same, the name, the plat for, for the same, with the same names. So therefore it must have been taken by eminent domain in order to create a highway for a Confederate general that would have kept black people enslaved. One of the things that's interesting about the, it's called South Washington and Falls Church, but uh, the house that we live in that Ed's grandparents built, when they put through the road, the house ended up on one side of the road and the barn ended up on the other side of the road. And when the cow got hit by a car and the Hendersons were sued and they lost and had to pay for the damage to, to the, the car, to the car and um, had to pay for the cow. They lost the cow, no milk for the babies. So uh, Henderson decided that he would sell the piece of land where the barn was. So many of the homes or small family farms that were disrupted by imminent, taking eminent domain, their livelihoods was compromised, but also their, the economics were compromised. If you can imagine what that property would be worth today in Falls Church, those families would be very well off. Okay, right here, uh, this is the 1880s. Uh, public education was mandated in Virginia. Uh, generally, it was run by the districts and not by the overall counties until early 1900s. But um, we, at the top, you see a two-room schoolhouse that was built, we believe, in 1888 um, with help from the Friends, as well as not just the county. And at the bottom, we see a white school, the Jefferson Institute. And if you look at them closely, you see a big difference. Um, the white school is brick, um, it's much larger, it's two stories, indoor plumbing, indoor heat, whereas the Negro school was clapboard, um, had pit toilets outside, no running water, and no heat, pot belly stoves in the middle of both of the two rooms to provide heat uh, for, the, for the students. Okay. 
Um, this is Mary Ellen Henderson, uh, as she was affectionately known. Miss Nellie, she was principal of the Falls Church Colored School. Uh, in 1919, she was asked to reopen the school after World War II. They couldn't seem to find a teacher because it was better pay for teachers in the DC colored schools. And uh, also um, the, um, the black, the African-American teachers were paid less than the white teachers. And so she opened the school in 1919, um, reopened the school. And uh, she uh, fought for equal opportunities in education for Falls Church African-Americans. Uh, she was, she and Ollie Tenor were constant fixtures at the Fairfax County School Board asking for uh, a better school. Um, the overcrowded school had auxiliaries in the churches and in the um, Odd Fellows Hall because there were so many that wanted to be educated and there was no room in those two rooms. Miss Nelly, she taught the uh, four to seven grades four to seven and Lola Saunders, Miss Lola Saunders taught kindergarten to third. The other thing that's very interesting is that um, this is Ed's grandmother. And at the time she and her, her, grand, her husband married Ed's grandfather, she was no longer allowed to work. She was a model teacher in Washington, DC. And at that time, they believed that if a woman was married, she could not teach because she'd not be capable of splitting her loyalty between her students and her family. So when she moved to Falls Church, she had planned on retiring and just taking care of her two sons, but the community begged her to reopen the school and after she told them that she could not because she had a young 19 month old baby, they told her, well, we'll find a babysitter for you. And they did. So she opened the school. Here, uh, Miss Nellie, as you can hardly see her, she wasn't a tall woman. Uh, and this is her class of fourth, seventh graders at the Falls Church Colored School. You think this picture is probably from the 1930s, um, judging from the, uh, the age of uh, my grandmother. Go ahead. One, one of the things that uh, she, Mary Ellen Henderson did at one point she was, they were going, she and Mr. Tenor were going back and forth to the school board asking for a new school to be built um, be, that had central heat and that had um, running water and the teachers wouldn't have to share toilets with the children, the outdoor pit toilets. And they would raise money and take it to the school board and say, we have money to contribute towards um, the new school. And finally, she decided to change her tactics. And at that point, she decided to look at the school budget and she discovered that 97.3%, 97.4 cents of every education dollar was spent on educating white children and only 2.6 cents was spent on educating black children. With that disparity study, she was able to build an interracial coalition of parents and teachers and elected officials. And finally, a new school was built just before she retired. We have a wonderful interview where she says an oral interview where she says, I never thought I would live long enough to see this building built. And if you go by the James Lee Community Center, you will now see a state historic marker that tells you about 
the founding of the school. Here's a picture of the old school and the new school. The new school facade is still there, um, even though there are a number of trees in front of it. Um, but we thought this picture was interesting because uh, it shows the old and the new. And that was built, uh, it opened in um, 1948, uh, 50, 1948, 49 school year. And she spent one year there as principal. But the new school had um, a room for every grade, indoor toilets, um, as well as an auditorium, which she insisted on. And for many years, the auditorium was renovated so it was just flat and no incline. And when they renovated again in the 90s, they put back the theater or the auditorium, which she insisted on. This woman here, Viola Hudson, was a person to be reckoned with in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And she helped to bring mail and other public utilities to the um, African-American community in Falls Church. And for that, she is to be recognized and commended. Anything? Um, <clears throat> I wanted to talk about this one, and it is another example of gerrymandering. Um, Fred Foote Sr.'s property was here at the interchange at Seven Corners. This house right here, this little white uh, speck right there, that's his home. And um, the property was um, never subdivided, but there was a uh, covenant put on in, in the deed by Fred Foote Sr. saying that the property was never to be sold. And if you look down here, you see this wooded area here, which was where the um, descendants of Fred Foot Sr., a lot of them lived. Well, um, a number of the, they couldn't come up with their taxes because it was rezoned as commercial property. They were being taxed out of it. And so, and over here, let's see, uh, the result of the, um, of the suit was the Seven Corners shopping center. And that's from 1961. Yeah, but this article from 1952 shows that there were, um, in 1952, uh, a judge ordered that the property was to be sold and set the price at $400,000 and then appointed two county commissioners to receive offers on the land. Um, the the uh, county commissioners um, later would be uh, charged with taking bribes from developers. But um, the, the price that the land eventually sold for was $750,000. Uh, there were nine indicted, um, five supervisors were indicted, as well as four um, developers. Two um, Fairfax County supervisors spent time in jail, as well as all four of the developers. Um, here is a suit from 1959, Fairfax County, um, the NAACP uh, filed suit against uh, in federal court and uh, they made it so that the, the uh, plan of the county schools to, to, uh, to desegregate one grade at a time uh, was not going to fly. And then they started a successful student placement campaign by African-Americans uh, to admit African-American students into the white schools. 
we have uh, lots more information to share with yeah. you, but we are out of time. We wanna leave some time for questions and answers. Um, as you can see, Tenor Hill Heritage Foundation has been very serious about collecting and preserving this history. And um, we are a 501c3 organization. And so we do fundraisers. In fact, we have one coming up. Uh, it's a play that's been written by Iona, Iona Blake, who is a young African-American uh, actor, producer, writer, and our fundraising night is February the 27th at 7 p.m. So if you go online at our website, tenorhill.org, or to Creative Cauldron's website, creativecauldron.org, it's a small black box theater that has very serious COVID protocols in place. There'll be a very small audience for this production, but I guarantee you that you will be interested. It's all about the types of challenges that African-American and women in general face as wives, mothers, and leaders in the community. So please come out and support us. I think there's questions and answers now. Yes. Um, how, how are we doing with you all on time? I know you had some time commitments. We only have a few questions. Are we okay? We're fine. I'm okay. going to be in the capable hands of my husband while I go pick up our granddaughter. <laughs> okay. From, from the garden. From Very the good. Yes, yes. Thank Very you so good. much. We enjoyed yeah. it. This was a very interesting presentation. I think everyone enjoyed it and we are getting lots of comments saying thank you so much to both of you. Um, Edwin, one of the questions was with regard to the Eliza Hicks home and grocery store, what is on that site or that location today or, or what's the intersection? Okay. Um, my Aunt Annie, um, who was Louise, with E.B. Henderson's sister. Um, she uh, redeveloped the property where the store and the home is into a strip mall next to the Falls Church. There's an m and bank there, and I'm not sure what else is there now, uh, but it's between, you know, the building where, um, where we showed you where John and Betsy Reed taught, that's actually still there but it's bricked in into a beige colored brick. And then beside that, between that and the church is the strip mall where the home and the store was. Okay, all right. I know exactly where you're describing. I'm hoping that that's a, a good enough explanation for our, our guest. You also talked about James Lee and yeah. I think I know the answer, but I'm gonna go to you as the expert is the James Lee Community Center named after that James Lee? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> it, it was the, uh, the, the, the facade in the front, the Falls Church Color School became the James Lee Elementary School. <clears throat> okay. And so that started out, they, they actually closed that school when they desegregated the schools. So nothing was there. I was looking at an article the other day. Uh, and then they built onto the school um, to create the um, community center. And then in the 90s, they were gonna close it, but so many people came out to uh, encourage them not to close it. Then not only did they not close it, but they increased, uh, they doubled the size of the footprint of the community center. So it's still there, it's still operating. And James Lee was the one who gave the land. There was some question about that, but I had the five deeds uh, that belonged to James Lee. And one of them showed that his widow bequeathed the land to Fairfax County Public Schools to build um, the James Lee Elementary School. So, Interesting, yeah. very good. 
Um, are you aware of, or does the um, Heritage Foundation do any walking tours of the area? Uh, we've been working on one for a while. Uh, and I think it's gonna actually end up being more than one. Um, but it's not, uh, we often do the tours on a um, individual basis or a when we can organize one, but there is no apparatus set up as of yet. We hope soon that there'll be a walking tour of the, um, the Falls Church African-American community. Okay, we put a link to the website in the uh, chat area um, mm -hmm. so that perhaps our guests can check with that website periodically to see if any walking tours are available. Number one, when it's warmer. Number two, when we're not in a pandemic. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, okay. I don't think we'd want to do one right now. Um, <laughs> but you can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram as well. Oh, okay. Very good. I have one question here asking if this presentation will be recorded. And I know the answer to that one. Yes, it will. It has been recorded and you will receive a link to the recording of this probably within the next 24 hours in your email. And it looks like Edwin, a couple of questions may have come in in the chat box. Let me just scroll through it real quick. Um, what role did the union forts at Seven Corners have in attracting African-Americans to the Tinner Hill area? Um, okay, I, I know of the fort. It's right there. Well, it's actually where Coons Ford was. Um, and there's okay. a little, uh, now I'm not sure that it attracted African-Americans to Falls Church. Um, I think more so after the war, the uh, efforts of people like uh, John, John, Colonel John Crocker was probably more instrumental. It became known that uh, Falls Church was an area where Blacks could, could purchase land. And that was very important to enslaved people because they were once property themselves and knew that true freedom was associated with owning your own property mm -hmm. and being able to have a place you can call home. Okay, very good. And it looks like one of our guests is must be very familiar with the area. They are asking if you live in the Henderson house. I do. <laughs> uh, this is uh, <laughs> this is uh, my inheritance. My father and my uncle were going to sell it at one time, along with the stores behind us who were built was built in 1950 by my grandparents. Um, but I told my father I wanted the house, and and he said, um, "Well, we're not going to sell it. Then you can you can have that as your inheritance." And just recently, there was a historic marker put in front of the house uh, honoring E.B. Henderson and uh, his um, uh, pursuit in becoming the father of black basketball, um, which I think we might have touched on early. Yeah. Okay, very good. And it looks like my last question for you today, Edwin, is if you would turn around, we've got some folks who want to know who are the pictures behind you? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, the pictures that are behind me are um, my great grandparents, Louisa and William over here. Okay. And uh, you saw pictures of them earlier in the PowerPoint. Um, uh, William was in a sailor's uniform and um, Louisa, sometimes called Lulu, um, was in a picture with my grandfather uh, as, a, as a young child. Very good. I, I believe that answers all of the questions that I have, but I do want to tell you there are a number of comments simply saying 
Thank you. They all thoroughly enjoyed uh, this presentation. It was filled with history and good information. And we thank you for saving the documents. Yes. Go ahead, Edwin. I'd like to say, well, you know, the, the research is continuing. You know, it's always going to, and a lot of times what we think is true or what we've come to conclusions that as you find out more, things change. Like uh, when we were talking about, um, um, Turner, Harriet Foot Turner. Uh, you have to understand that uh, Virginia was a, a state where after tobacco was in decline, the border states and the northern states supplied the southern states where King Cotton took place. So rather than her going to um, Franklin and Armfield and on Duke Street in Alexandria to pick up slaves, she was actually taking slave, slave people from the plantation to be sold down south. That's my, because Armfield, uh, Franklin and Armfield sold over a million black people into slavery in the south. Some people even say that Virginia was a slave breeding state. And like Lumpkin in, in um, Sky Lumpkin in Richmond, who boasted that he sold 6,000 slaves African-Americans a year into the South. And it was very profitable because uh, the, the value of a slave here would double down South. And that's how Franklin and Armfield became multi, multi-millionaires during slavery. So there's a lot of research that's still going on and uh, we're not done yet telling exactly. our story. Exactly. No, we're not done yet. And thank goodness, when we know better, we do better. Yes. And with that, I will turn the program back over to Opal. Opal, it's okay. all yours. Thank well, you. I can truly say I have been so uplifted by this presentation, not only as an African American, uh, but also as a resident of Falls Church. Uh, I learned so much today. You are a national treasure. Uh, Tenor Hill and Edwin and Nikki, we want to thank you so much for your dedicated work. When so many African Americans don't, don't know or have lost their history, that you all continue to keep it alive and well. And I'm, I'm so, I always think of what uh, Maya Angelou said, and still we rise. And so we thank you and Nikki for continuing to tell our story. It's, it's just so wonderful. So anyway, on the behalf of AARP, I'd like to again thank our guests for sharing their valuable time and knowledge. Uh, you can tell by the number of people that attended that this program was well received. We've gone over time because everybody wanted to hear the story and I hope you will come back one day. Uh, I'm a transplant to Falls Church from Philadelphia, but I'm so proud that I moved to an area that has such a rich heritage. We'd love to get your feedback on today's program, ideas for future programs, and in the chat box, you'll see a link to a survey. Please click on that link and take a few moments to share your feedback with us. We'll also send this link in a follow-up email later today. So we really do invite you to continue to celebrate Black History Month with us. Our Tuesday Explorers programs in February will focus on rich contributions of African-Americans to our local communities and beyond, just like this rich heritage of Tenor Hill we heard today. Join us to learn about the early history of the birth of Black basketball. And oddly enough, but not oddly enough, it's Mr. Henderson's grandfather who <laughs> started the first black basketball initiative in the United States. In the chat box, you'll see a link to register for these and other black history programs. So until next time, we encourage you to stay curious and keep exploring. Once again, thank you, Nikki and Edwin. A fantastic program. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. And I see your granddaughter has joined us. Would she like to say goodbye for us and we'll close out the program? Say goodbye, Janaira. Take it back. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Take care.